Final Fantasy XV is a game full of surprises. Unlike pretty much every other game in the series, it's a shoot traditional JRPG combat to focus on action spectacle, it's got a lovely open world to run around in, and to top it all off, it's got an almost comprehensible story. Speaking of which, I am going to be avoiding story spoilers in this video for the most part, with the exception of one big spoiler towards the end, which I will give you fair warning of. The real surprise for me when playing Final Fantasy XV was its supporting cast of NPCs. In FF15, you play as Noctis, a prince, who travels around the world with his boy band esque retinue. There's Gladiolus, the tough one, Ignis, the smart one, and Prompto, the funny one. These characters are underwritten, have some dodgy voice acting in places, and just will not shut up. So why are they my favourite part of the game? Before I answer that question, let's ask another one. What is an NPC? New Philanthropy Capital? No, that can't be right. National Pensioners Convention? Oh, I don't know. Oh, right! Non-player character, of course. NPCs are instrumental to game design because they're the best way of inducing a sense of immersion and communicating directly to the player in a way that doesn't break our suspension of disbelief. In this video I'm going to focus mostly on companion character NPCs because that's really where the most interesting topics lie, but the lessons here apply to any kind of NPC, because they all do the same job, making the world feel more alive. Not breaking a player's suspension of disbelief is very important, because while we're totally immersed in a piece of media, we're able to learn about it and understand it much more effectively. Don't believe me? Think about the difference between a sterile training level tutorial and a learning on the fly immersive tutorial that's just kind of the intro to regular gameplay. The latter is infinitely more effective because you can make direct mental connections between gameplay ideas. There's a reason why all the best fighting games go out of their way to make every character very distinct and likeable, because the more a given player can engage with a character, the easier it is to get immersed in playing as them. When you're constantly reminded that you're playing a game and what you're doing isn't real, there's a conceptual barrier between you and the game, but when you're allowed to get totally absorbed in the experience, that barrier breaks down. With nothing in between you and the game, you push the outside world and even the physical input you're making to the back of your mind, letting you engage with the game on a much more personal level. Look at this bit in Half-Life 2 Episode 1 with the explodey suicide zombies, or as Alex so succinctly puts it, that. Hmm. A combine zombie? That's... That's like a... a, a zombine. Right? <laughs> Zombine, get it? <laughs> Alex's presence adds some much needed levity to a pretty bleak portion of the game, and her believable reactions to the world inform the player of what's going on and how Look they should out. react to it. Namely, to uh, run away. In addition, having more than one character to root for also helps make the world feel like it doesn't specifically revolve around the player, and that it at least appears to be a cohesive reality containing real people. In that vein, absolutely everything in Final Fantasy XV is contextualised through the figurative or literal lens of the characters and their actions. Fast travel, that's Ignis or Noctis driving the car, picking up items dropped by enemies, that's Gladio's survival training in action, fighting bad guys, well, your companions do it all on their own because of course they do, they're real people, right? Noctis, Gladiolus, Ignis and Prompto are all used to sell this illusion of a real cohesive world that you can get immersed in and develop a personal attachment to. When the team camps out and has a chance to cook a meal, it'd be really easy to just deduct the materials and give people the appropriate stat boosts, but Final Fantasy XV goes above and beyond. It puts in the effort of showing Ignis come up with the recipes as you source appropriate ingredients, it shows him cook the meal and serve it up, and there's even a short side quest where you can help him cook. All this serves eh? to intimately connect the character of Ignis and everything related to food in the game as well as associate him with the very helpful stat boosts meals give. The more you cook to get crucial buffs for your team, the more attached you become to Ignis specifically, because the game makes it very clear he's the one responsible, not you. That's it! What's up, Iggy? I've come up with a new recipe. <laughs> Can't wait to try it. There's a portion towards the mid-game where Gladiolus, my least liked character of the main four, has to leave for a bit. And damn it if I didn't actually miss the guy. Why? Because on top of being a crucial component of the team's dynamic, the utility he offered as a tank and scavenger were unique to him, and my experience felt like it was missing a piece. Purely on his writing merits, I didn't really care for the guy, but by tying his character to the gameplay effects he has to offer, I couldn't help but develop an attachment to Gladio that felt very personal. One of Final Fantasy XV's lead designers, who goes by Soon, 
is a huge fan of separating the story from the storytelling. Uh, what? What the hell does that mean? The story of Final Fantasy XV is the go save the world quest, but the storytelling is the smaller, more emergent narratives you create for yourself through gameplay. I didn't pay all that much attention to the actual story, which is reasonably forgettable, but I did remember how the characters reacted to it. Having little conversations about it that not only fleshed out the world and their personalities, it also served to keep me and no doubt other players up to date with the plot, even after a couple of days of not playing. This also meant the designers didn't have to resort to the dreaded Bioware style codex, which is the narrative equivalent of trying to eat cement. And those very same small stories are captured by Prompto, who's a photographer and displayed whenever you rest. Now, his photography AI is incredibly complicated and really deserves its own video, but it's got two special features that help the game weave a personal narrative that's unique to you and your digital boy band friends. Firstly, on top of taking photos during big story moments and new locations, the photo AI is designed to trigger at pseudo-random intervals, capturing little incidental stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily be paying attention to, even if it's something as dumb as you wasting some easy enemies. And when you look at the photos, the characters all have something to say about it. Secondly, Prompto rarely features in the photos. Why? Because he's the one taking them. All the quests about taking photos and Prompto's constant nattering about his hobby inject some extra character into even the most mundane of shots, as you can't help but imagine why exactly Prompto loves taking photos of people's butts so much. Nice. We automatically care about the mechanics of games because we want to be good at them, but by immersing us to the extent that the NPCs are the mechanics, we develop a personal investment in them too. The advantages of making NPCs that bridge the gap between the player and the game world aren't just limited to abstract emotional experience things either. They're a great way to get the player to listen to you because they're invested in who's saying it. No more is this clearer than in the case of how the game handles nighttime. At night, big scary demons come out and will just kick the shit out of you at a moment's notice. I'm not even kidding, they're really tough. This is of course a deliberate choice to keep the feeling of an unmasterable, cohesive reality going until well into the mid-game, but the best bit is how you get told about it. If you're about to go for a drive at or near nighttime, Ignis will tell you more or less that he's not going to drive at night because he doesn't want to die, but if you've got a death wish, then go ahead. This is a fantastic interaction and my second favourite part of the game because it A. Teaches the player something about the game in a way that they'll listen to, seeing Ignis, Mr. Cole calculating know it all be scared of something for a change, is a big deal, and accurately conveys both the seriousness of the lesson and some new character details about Ignis, namely that he's scared of taking risks something that gets expanded upon in future interactions. B. It gets players to play the game in the way they're supposed to, by engaging with the all-important loop of adventuring with your friends during the day and camping out at night without breaking the player's immersion, because everything about this scenario actually makes sense in-universe, from Ignis's desire to protect you to demons coming out at night actually being a plot point. Thirdly, and most crucially, the game lets you drive at night anyway because you're a prince and no one tells you what to do which means you'll probably get your very handsome butt kicked. This is the area where a lot of NPCs in other games fall down. NPCs are supposed to be a conduit for the player through which they can engage with the rest of the game, but by becoming an annoyance or an outright barrier in the way of gameplay, they instead prevent the player from doing just that. See how the Final Fantasy XV devs use NPCs to leverage the player's existing familiarity with the characters and the core loop of the game to gently push them in the right direction and get them to have the intended experience. Compare that with someone like Preston Garvey from Fallout 4, who serves a similar role, done much more poorly. In a franchise that's pretty much all about player freedom, self-determination and observable consequences for your decisions, Preston does not react realistically to your actions, still deciding to follow your orders long after you've murdered his friends. He actively distracts from both the exploration-driven nature of Fallout and the main quest by forcing irritating busy work upon you, and most damaging of all, is that he can't be killed no matter how hard you try, forcing you to keep hanging out with him and shattering what little is left of your immersion. Now I won't beat around the bush, Preston is an easy target, but here's what people don't think about. In a different game, Preston would have been an effective, the hell even likeable NPC. In a much more linear, less choice driven game that was all about saving the Minutemen and rebuilding the Commonwealth, Preston's dynamic of an enthusiastic but untrained right hand man who overcompensates to make himself feel better compared to your tough, army-trained main character, could have been a really effective way to communicate to the player in a way that emphasises that they're in charge, but they've got a job to do. Unfortunately, in a game that emphasises freedom as much as Fallout, he just end up feeling like the errand boy for a needy, immortal idiot. 
NPCs are great at drawing the spotlight away from the player and making you feel like you're simply a part of a big wide world, but what about if you deliberately omit NPCs and make the player feel alone? Horror games love doing this, as the lack of external contact forces the player to get immersed not in the game, but the inner machinations of their own mind, letting their imagination do the busy work of scaring them. Note how a game like Inside deliberately dehumanises anything that could come close to being an actual character because it's trying to creep you out by making you feel isolated, whereas Resident Evil, which is much more just trying to engage with the horror aesthetic for campy fun reasons, has you constantly interacting with other characters. The overall presence of NPCs can have a huge effect on the feel of a game, and changing this up can upset the existing dynamics of play, intensifying any emotional changes the player feels. I've saved talking about the best part of Final Fantasy XV for the end because it's a big spoiler, so if you don't want to hear about it you can skip to the conclusion here. Towards the end of the game, right after a big boss fight, Ignis, best boy of the whole party, loses his sight. Permanently. This means he can no longer cook for you and he is all but useless in a fight. I'm amazed by how this shift affected me, seeing my favourite character stumble around blindly in a fight trying and failing to help like his old self is an emotional gut punch, and it only works because of the fact that the narrative and the mechanics of the game have been tied together through Ignis and the other NPCs. If I didn't care about Ignis or he had no effect on the gameplay anyway, this wouldn't matter, but because you're drastically nerfed in terms of fighting ability and you lose out on some of the most powerful buffs in the game until after you've beaten it, the sense of loss is unavoidable. Whilst Ignis' blindness does make playing the game more difficult, it avoids falling into Preston Garvey territory because it doesn't interrupt the intended experience of the game, it is the intended experience. That's not to say the second half of Final Fantasy XV isn't a rushed, overly linear mess, because it is, but the integrity behind the decision to not magically heal Ignis at any point seriously impressed me, and more games should have the courage to make NPCs less effective rather than more as the game progresses, because it's much more emotionally resonant. Even when he does learn to live with his blindness in the final chapters, his combat style is drastically changed, with him becoming a ranged support character rather than the magic-y melee jack-of-all-trades he was at the start. Welcome back, spoiler avoidy folks, Snape kills Dumbledore, Bruce Willis was a ghost the whole time, Kylo Ren is Rey's dad. We as people who play video games often find we have visceral reactions to NPCs in one direction or the other. We love NPCs from games we like, and they're the object of our hatred for games we think suck. <coughs> for that for <coughs> That's because of all things in a video game, NPCs, in particular ones that are actual narrative forces, are lightning rods for our emotional and logistical understanding of games. I'd highly recommend going and looking back at the most memorable NPCs from your own gaming experiences with this knowledge in hand, and understanding why you liked, or in fact loathed them so much. But to get back to the real topic, which Final Fantasy XV boy has the best butt? Well, to answer that question we need to ask, what is a butt? Allow me to explain. This video is made possible thanks to your generous support on Patreon. My Patreons get special thank yous like the occasional review, game recommendations, and even a monthly Q&A slash update video. In addition to the people on your screen right now, I'd like to give a very special thank you to Samuel Vanderplatz, Patrick Romberg, Jean Chukron, Alex Delach, Baxter Heel, Strateger in Ultima, Dominic Sudlow, Daniel Metjes, Apatropos, Asaran, Brian Natariani, Vodshyam Palagora, Asteroid Baby, and Chow. Thank you all very much again, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.